uh, affecting tomorrow. There's no programming tomorrow, but... So tomorrow, uh, President Obama is coming to Seattle, so they will be shutting down some roads starting at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, so just, I guess, fit that into your travel plans. Be aware of that. Uh, traveling by road might be more difficult than normal tomorrow. Um, also, if you're going to the gala tonight, there will be a bus in front of the motif. Uh, so just out the lobby, just walk towards the street um, at 5.30, at 5.40, and at 5.50 to take you to the Museum of Flight. Um, though if you're driving there, there is plenty of parking, so that will not be an issue. Uh, coming back, there will be buses leaving the museum starting at 10.45, uh, and then I believe there's three, and I think they'll leave every 10 minutes, though I'm not positive on that. I will double check that. Uh, for the next time I'm up here. So I am going to be introducing uh, somebody who works for one of our sponsors, uh, Satellite 2017. I've attended Satellite uh, in the past. It is a satellite conference. Uh, next year it will be from March 6th to 9th in Washington, DC. Uh, they have a lot of really cool things there. For uh, the younger crowd, they have something called SGX which is run by the Space Generation Advisory Council, and it's kind of like a TEDx uh, based all around space. I went this, this year, and there were really great speakers, and it was definitely worth it. Even just getting out to the conference just for that, I think would be worth it. Um, and then they also have you know, the standard satellite programming and exhibits. Uh, they are the largest and most important global satellite communications event of the year, gathering professionals from all markets of the satellite community. So if you would like more information on that, you can check them out at satshow.com. But now I'm going to call up Jeffrey Hill, who will introduce our last keynote speaker of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, before I, I start, I want to like to thank uh, our hosts here at New Space, Sat, Kat, Hannah, Brandon, Jeff, and Andrew, and the rest of their fantastic crew of volunteers. Let's give them a round of applause for putting on such a wonderful conference. <laughs> Throughout the conference, we've been talking about the need for better storytelling uh, for what we do in the aerospace world, uh, specifically to not only our investors, but to the general public. And uh, the, the people here at New Space have gathered quite a few of these storytellers, some very good storytellers here, like Alan Boyle and Jeff uh, Faust and El Emily Calandrelli, and our closing keynote speaker. Uh, I went to journalism school, and when I was in journalism school, uh, Miles O'Brien was already uh, uh, all over CNN as a, as a science uh, reporter. I mean, we, we studied him uh, and specialists, uh, technology specialists uh, that were on television. Uh, I think I wrote a paper on the role of, of, of special reporters on, on TV and got like an A minus. I remember talking about uh, uh, Miles' role on CNN uh, and how that role was changing now that, that technology was evolving. Um, He's a third-generation aviation pilot from Detroit. Uh, he's a producer and correspondent for PBS NewsHour, producer and director for PBS uh, science documentary series you might have heard of called Nova. Uh, he is a correspondent for the National Science Foundation's Science Nation series Frontline, uh, an aviation analysis for uh, CNN, and the former chairman of the NASA Advisory Council's Public Outreach Committee. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce Miles O'Brien, your closing keynote. Thank you. Thank you there, Sonny. It's good to be studying in school, let me tell you. You know you're getting old when you get an introduction like that, but uh, it's good to still be standing anyhow. Um, and this proves that the last keynote is truly the tumbleweed keynote. It's good to see the few of you. You want to come in a little closer, everybody, class? Um, anyway, let's tell you, but those of you who stay, you're going to be so glad you were here because we're going to talk about how better to communicate to the general public about space, and if you have any questions, I'll attempt to entertain them. So long as I can still hear, you know, 
So uh, this, let's go back to uh, 1969. I want to talk about engineers, what engineers think a good story is, and what really a good story is, and the disconnect that often occurs. How many in this room were alive on July 20th, 1969? Good. How many of you remember this moment? Excellent. There are a few of us here still standing. Thank God for that. Of course, this was the moment. Let's listen to Walter. It's a little shadowy, but... Uh I love the graphics. In the shadow of the lunar module. Armstrong is on the moon. Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. That's one small death for man. That's early high definition there. Um... <laughs> I love the graphics, right? 500 million people are watching. There were 3.3 billion people on the planet. That's what we call a good number in television. That is, there's never been a Super Bowl that it came close to that one. Um, and guess what? I, that maybe those who are alive know some of this history. It is actually very, it came so close to not happening at all, this television moment. Do you guys know this story? So the deal was this. Um, no mission requirement for a camera. Engineers being engineers, they meet mission requirements. And anything that doesn't meet a mission requirement is drawing power or adding to your mass. And you don't want to do that. Weight is a problem. You guys know that. And so uh, what happened was it went back and forth. Should there be a camera? And the debate went up until literally weeks before uh, the launch. Uh, there was an engineer, the man in charge of communication at Apollo at the time, Ed Fendel. Ed, in his infinite wisdom, said, no mission requirement. TV should not go to the moon. It is not required for scientific purposes. Now, you have to think about how an engineer thinks. If it's not something I need to put on for the mission requirement, then, by definition, it is sapping that requirement. So, from a blank sheet, the camera probably should have been on the lunar module. I think we can all agree with that right now. What happened was, thank you for that little piece of history. We had some people who overruled Mr. Fendel, people like Chris Kraft, uh, Julian Scheer, the famous uh, PR person for NASA at the time, and the, the esteemed Maxime Faget, who designed the capsule. They overruled it. We got the camera, and we got the ability to watch on that July 9th um, that moment in history. But that tells you a little something about how engineers think and how we in the storytelling business think. We don't always, well, we don't always get along. Um, you know, before NASA ever stopped to think much about communication, uh, they were doing some crazy-ass stuff in public there. <laughs> you know, they just put the cameras on, and in the early 60s, what a show. Um, and so, inadvertently, accidentally, they laid the groundwork for a great narrative. Everybody was primed for, frankly, a disaster. What would happen if human beings were in the midst of all of this. The, the, the danger was palpable. You know, put that in the context of the Cold War race, and you had a perfect narrative. What was missing from all this? Q central casting. Uh, the guys in silver, the right stuff guys, the Mercury 7, they were augmented by that sweet uh, Life magazine deal, which uh, gave them a little extra revenue behind, beyond their government uh, contracts, and made them the face of the space race. People were rooting for them, and they couldn't help but think about the old flop neck days on what might happen. This is, um, this is what we call the good narrative arc, right? So um, then what happened was this. <laughs> then we, we all know the rest of the story. We got the guys in the moon. It was great. And then we got this. Um, STS, the Space Transportation System. So in its infinite wisdom, NASA decided that the really interesting and compelling thing was to sell the American people on how absolutely banal space is. Um, let's make it look routine. Let's make it look like an airliner. Let's not make the astronauts uh, uh, stars in any way. Let's make it all about work, which is good. I think we can all agree, everybody in this room, we want to do real work in space. But from my perspective, as a guy who's trying to tell stories, I need a little more than that. Uh, take a listen to Maxime Paget. 
It uh, resembles a Delawing airplane on top of a propulsion system. The system is going to be designed so all of the costly parts are reusable. Uh, now that we're beginning to understand space, we're beginning to understand uh, the potential, the economic potential. The need is to bring larger arrays of instrumentation up in space. The need to provide man with a real capability to work up in space. So, uh, not exactly going to bring masses to the television for this thing, right? We're going to work in space, we're going to build a truck, it's going to be great, it's going to be cheaper. Uh, there was nothing in there that got people engaged in the space program. As a matter of fact, look at this video, I love this one. I have 3,000 uh, miles range to go. CRT displays look good. This research pilot is simulating a landing of the reusable space shuttle. The shuttle is a cargo-carrying combination spacecraft and aircraft able to carry large payloads to and from Earth and space 100 times or more. It's scheduled for use in the early 1980s. That's great stuff, huh? So what it lacked was, frankly, it didn't have faces, right? There were some exceptions to that. We had so the ride, of course, people paid attention to that. And then, of course, tragically, the next one that we really focused on was with Krista McAuliffe. And we know how that ended. So here's the thing. NASA on that day had um, kind of really up to that point with the shuttle, had, had done a pretty good job of getting people to tune out. So people were, number one, kind of apathetic. They had been told by Maxime Faget and others that this was all about doing it cheaper. And it's really no more interesting than watching airplanes land at National Airport. And therefore, it is safe. And as you know, they didn't even wear pressure suits. They were, they were, they were perpetuating a myth of safety, which they thought was going to help them continue to fund the program. But when things went bad and it would laid bare the, the evident lie of all of that, uh, that apathy turned immediately into anger. They didn't have friends. They hadn't done a job making friends, uh, putting a face to the program, having a dialogue with people, making them understand what the program was about. And I would say it seems kind of counterintuitive. Had they been more honest about how risky it was, they would have had a better time getting through all of this because there would have been there wouldn't have been this idea that people felt kind of hoodwinked by NASA. So um, honesty is the best policy in my theory. Uh, and now that does sound self-serving, and it is, but you know, that's why I'm here. Hey, I get a, I get a free uh, opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, by the time Columbia came around, um, you know, the, a, a second uh, kind of a repeat in many ways of, of uh, Challenger, uh, there was no real great opportunity to save uh, the shuttle program at that point. And so we moved on. And there's a lot of good reasons that that's good for uh, space in general and certainly people in this room now that we've moved into another era. Um, so it's a tough way to have that, that program kind of end. So um, in the course of doing what I did at CNN for 17 years, I got uh, very close to the space shuttle program, obviously, and or as close as you could be. And I got to cover um, you know, numerous shuttle missions, including John Glenn's return to flight. And I am, I think, the only guy in the world who can say his co-anchor was Walter Cronkite. And uh, I'm, you know, humble brag, huh? Not bad. That was kind of fun. So Walter Cronkite was my co-anchor, you know, and, and um, lots of fun stories about that. But one of the things that really um, struck me at the time, you know, so of course was constantly bending uh, his ear and asking him for tales of the old days. And he was talking about coming down for the early launches, you know, pre-NASA launches, really, when they, you know, the, the, the Germans had just kind of gotten some old, you know, V-2 rockets and were trying to see how they worked and reverse engineer them, that kind of stuff. And he would, you know, he'd rec he would be covering things from the back of a station wagon on radio. They would go out to the, the Cape Canaveral jetty at night and they would be looking for which gantry would light up. It's kind of like criminologists in the Cold War. Whichever office was, you know, burning a light, they knew who was in, in favor. And they'd sit there with their, their eye on the eyepiece, waiting to see which one was going to launch. 
And then, you know, they, they, there was a uh, hotel owner there by the name of Henry Landworth, and he, he knew that these guys were out there waiting for these uh, launches with no information whatsoever. And what would happen would be if there was a scrub, the non-essential personnel would be dismissed and they'd go to Henry Landworth's bar. And so whenever they showed up at the bar, they would, he would send a runner out to Walter and his team to say, hey, there's been a scrub, you can come in and drink. And so I'm thinking, now that's the way to cover space, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is good. You know, and of course it was a different era. They knew it was a very intimate time. They got they knew the people, they had they had up close access, uh, not the kind of access I was used to with uh, the space shuttle program. So then came uh, the wonderful experience of the X Prize, uh, the Ansari X Prize, and the, the the success that we had in Mojave. That was that I had uh, Dick Rotan as my co-anchor on that. That was kind of fun. Although I do remember when Mike Melville did that crazy aileron roll that he was doing, and, and I looked at Dick, and he looked panicked. That scared me a lot. This is coming on the heels of, um, of Columbia, of course. But what was great about that is uh, I, had, I had my own kind of Walter experience. I mean, I wasn't waiting for some runner to tell me when to go drink, but uh, I was able to literally go into the hangar at Scaled, uh, just less than an hour after they had pulled the thing in, kind of kicked the tires on the spacecraft and talked to Mike Melville. And I thought, this is, this is the way it should be. This is human. This is, you know, the kind of, kind of connection that people want to have. And more importantly, it portended an era where we all might get a chance to go. Uh, it's taken a little longer, but I'm still convinced that that day will come for us. So um, I was riding high and uh, enjoying my CNN time. Uh, got to fly in the Vomit Comet a few times, and then things went sour for me and my team. You know, it takes a village to prop up a network correspondent. There were six producers making me look good, and we all got fired one day, and uh, that was tough. But at that point, we realized there was astonishingly little interest in what we loved at CNN. Basically, if we knew about the Kardashians, we'd still be there today or Trump for that matter, you know, so, but we're not. And that seemed cataclysmic to me at the time, uh, so much so that I did what every self-respecting middle-aged guy who gets a pink slip did. I grew a beard <laughs> <laughs> and looked like Ted Kaczynski, you know, <laughs> in the wetness protection program or something. Um, so. While I was sitting there pondering my fate, counting up how much severance money I had, I spent a lot of time thinking about this place, this newsroom from whence I came. What, uh, what, what, what is wrong with this place is part of what I'm thinking. Um, you know, it's not, um, it's not that there is apathy about science and technology in a place like this. There is outright hostility. These are people, these are poli sci you know, I, I should tell you, I'm a history major. I just play a scientist on TV. Uh, these are people who, you, you know, the periodic table gave them a cold sweat. And they are the people who are in charge of this newsroom. And the idea of putting science on TV is, frankly, the reason it was on CNN for so long is it was sponsored by AT&T. And when AT&T stopped that sponsorship, it was just a matter of time before it would all be over. Um, so I started you know, looking at what they were doing and watching, and this is what I Take saw. Take a look at these pictures that we're going to be sharing with you. I was just asking Chad, <laughs> how can you get a volcano in Iceland? Isn't it too... too when, you think of, when you think of a volcano, you think of like Hawaii and long words like that. You don't think of Iceland. You You're think right. it's too cold to have a volcano there. But no... There it is. Look at that. What, do you, what is this? That is Go a, that take is, us through these pictures. That, that is a plume of ash coming out of the top of a volcano going straight up. What's tens, the white stuff? Tens that's of that's that's just a cloud. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so at least CNN was in good hands, right? It was really going to be fine. And I got to say, the next one is gratuitous, but it's too much fun. So do you mind? Will you indulge me? Can we do one more Rick Sanchez, please? Okay, thank you. Here we go. <laughs> here. Uh, you can see the line and notice this big drop. Down here, we have this big drop. This is about a nine-meter drop. Nine-meter drop. Nine meters. What does that mean? It, well, it <laughs> means that the ocean waves are doing something, that we're seeing some changes. It's been going down, and look at that. We've got a big rise. And so we're going to get our expert in here who's way smarter than you and me put together, yeah. uh, Dr. Kurt Frankel. And uh, Dr. Frankel, tell us a little bit, you know, 
know, we talk about how the tsunami waves will come in or the water will pull back right. before we start to see. Yeah. Is this a sign of that? I think that's a sign of that. Uh, I don't think you can translate that nine meters into necessarily any, any specific wave height that will hit Hawaii. So we need to be careful about that. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean there's nine, nine meters of, of run up in, in, in Hawaii. Uh, but it's just showing that the, the tsunami impact. Nine aspect. meters, by, by, by the way, nine meters in English is? Oh, uh, about 27 feet. 27 feet. Yeah, 30 so, feet. So we're seeing a 27 <laughs> So, uh, for those of you who thought it was a great idea to call up CNN and try to get your story on CNN, forget it. Nobody's there. There's nobody there to pick up the phone. They have no clue. Uh, if, if, if Donald Trump was going to space, they might take your call, and I don't know. I, it's, this is just what, it's, it's, it's what happens. So, what the heck? You know, on we go. On to the next thing. Um, and what's interesting is uh, a lot of people like you and, frankly, NASA, saw in nature of pours a vacuum, right? There's the vacuum. And uh, at JPL, which has also been kind of a leader in the social networking side of things at NASA, uh, a few things lined up. Um, first of all, they realized that there wasn't going to be the kind of coverage that they used to get for the Mars Phoenix landing. It also happened to be on a Memorial Day weekend. And uh, so there, was, and they, they, there was nobody to call anymore in the, in the newsrooms who knew anything about science or space or cared that much. It, and this is what I'm talking about at the networks. So my friend, Veronica McGregor, who actually is a former CNNer and runs the news uh, department at JPL and is very savvy on this, mostly because she listens to her kids, because her kids in a way said, hey, you ought to try this new thing, Twitter, mom. And that way, you know, you can, you, you'll, you'll be a hero and you can stay home and have a barbecue with us on Memorial Day weekend. So she started tweeting as the Mars Phoenix, the first person. And this started uh, some weeks in, in advance of the um, entry, descent, and landing phase. And it was, it was kind of cute. You know, she was tweeting, you know, I'm, I'm, I've landed. I'm, I got the rockets on. My parachute's open. Oh, it's getting hot. All this stuff. And people loved it. And at the time, okay, these numbers are actually kind of funny. But it was, it was the top one or two um, Twitter accounts and most follows and all that stuff. And the numbers are, mm -hmm. they had 38,000 <laughs> followers. Woo-hoo. This is early Twitter days, okay? So I think if you do the, you know, the inflation component, that puts them at Lady Gaga or something like that. So, so um, it was a huge hit. And what she learned uh, by, you know, understanding that Rick Sanchez was the, the option, the alternative, uh, was that she could reach an audience in an entirely different way. Her initial concern was, however, that she would just kind of be preaching to a choir here. The only people that would be of the 38,000 would be people who cared anyway. But she found something else out. It, was, it didn't quite go that way. Listen to her. This was really amazing for me because when we started this account, I expected to have maybe a couple hundred people sign up, people who were really interested in NASA missions, sort of the audience that was already sold on NASA missions and really followed them on a, on a daily basis. And what ended up happening is we had this enormous following from public, many of whom wrote and said they had never followed a NASA mission before. They had thought they'd never be interested in following a NASA mission before. But by getting these little tiny updates day, day by day of what the mission was doing, they were fascinated by it. Good insight, Veronica. So um, that kind of changed NASA. From there on out, NASA started thinking that way uh, and tweeting and they actually have a pretty impressive uh, social networking component and are always in the you know top five on the number of um, uh, their various accounts and visits and hits and so forth they, they do well on the web which is a good thing and they don't need they don't need whoever is at CNN or me for that matter to tell their story uh, and that's an important takeaway for all this uh, from my perspective I here I was I, I finally shaved the beard off, uh, but I really, the, the first shuttle launch of my post-CNN days was coming up, and just selfishly, I, I didn't want to miss a launch, you know, it was kind of part of my ritual. And so I started thinking about, well, what does it take to share a story anymore? I mean, it's not, we, I don't need a satellite truck, I don't need, uh, I don't need a building, I don't need all those guys in the newsroom who hate what I'm doing anyway. What if I just called my buddy at Space Flight Now, Stephen Young, and, and what if we just plugged in a Mac and a, a camera and plugged in NASA television? What if we just went down there and started talking for six hours, you know, one inch wide, 500 miles deep, and covered the launches this way? 
Well, we did, and, and we did like, we did the last seven launches, I think, this way. We got them sponsored um, uh, from the various contractors because they too, you know, they, no one was covering them anymore. And it was, it was fantastic because not only were we able to talk at, you know, no commercial breaks, ad, ad nauseum about things we loved, but we, we would engage people to give us texts and tweets. And so it really became a dialogue. It was much more than the, you know, the two minutes I got on CNN, which inevitably would upset everybody. The space lovers didn't get enough. The people who hate space thought it was too much. In the end, no one got educated in any way, shape, or form. It was just uh, two minutes of blah, blah, blah. And there goes a rocket. What's it, where's it going? What's it doing? We, no one knows. Um, so basically, I learned th that we are in the post network era. But now I th I'm coming to the conclusion we're in the post-me era. You don't need me. And um, I say that without being self-serving. Uh, there are uh, a lot of ways for you to reach the public. And you've been following this thing? This, is, this just happened overnight. This is a perfect example. You know, they, they have a sit-in uh, on the floor of the House. A little gun control legislation might be a good idea to not allow people who are on the terrorist watch list to have these guns, just parenthetically. But the, the Republicans who control the House turned off the cameras. So what they do, they just went up on Periscope. You know, they, you know, so if it's not CNN or the Republicans, whatever it is, there's, a, there's any number of ways to reach people. And they reached a lot of people this way. Uh, this has gone for, uh, remember this one? See this bomb gardener? I just, I just love watching this. It gives me a complete vertigo to watch. Holy cow! Jeez! He did it again. He every he jumps every time. Oh, more than eight million people tuned in to the Red Bull webcast, live stream webcast to watch this thing. There's Joe Kittinger, the guy who's recording. That was a nice touch. What a great experience. They didn't need CNN. They didn't need uh, me. They, they just did whatever they wanted to do. And, and you guys in this business have done well with this, too. Just this past week, um, Blue Origin's kind of coming out of its uh, uh, quiet period, I guess you could say, and um, did the, uh, the webcast, which uh, I thought um, was excellent and a good step forward because I'll get to participate in that. Of course, Elon and SpaceX, that's part of the routine. They do their own thing. They don't want anybody else controlling their message. They control their own message. And then you have at the top, you have, you know, I, was Jeff, I think this was Jeff Bezos' his first tweet. The rarest of beasts, a used rocket, controlled landing, not easy, but done right, can look easy. Check out the video. But, of course, Mr. Musk said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> not quite rarest, SpaceX Grasshopper did. Or, you know, the, so, you know, a little uh, Twitter smackdown is a good thing for engaging... The public, in my view, I say go for it, guys, you know, and, um, but, you know, I think it's important to flesh it out with a few more individuals. Now, let's go back to JPL, my favorite NASA place when it comes to social engagement. Um, this is Curiosity. Remember, it was Curiosity, entry, descent, landing, the most crazy-ass sky crane thing, that thing. It was nuts, you know, and, and I don't think anybody at JPL was convinced it was going to work. And so what do they do about it? Did they, did they say, oh, it's going to be fine? No. They embrace the risk, maybe even hype the risk a little bit. Listen, look at the, I assume you've seen this video, but I'll play a little bit of it in case you know. It's great stuff. When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it. <laughs> It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. But it still looks crazy. <laughs> so the so went. So, you know, the seven minutes of terror and all this. And and so there are a couple of things that are key there. Number one, embrace the risk. Be honest with people about it. We got this crazy ass idea. It may or may not work. Space is hard, folks. Space is hard. That makes people want to watch. It's not the shuttle. Well, this is going to be very cheap, and, and we're going to do it in such a way that we can do it 100 times. Whew, that's not good storytelling. So, um, and the other thing they did was they, they put some faces to it. Adam Stelsner and, of course, our famous friend Mohawk guy <laughs> got there 15 minutes, didn't they? <clears throat> but that meant a lot more to people. So my takeaways to all of you, 
are continue your social networking, amp it up in my view, continue the dialogue, make friends along the way, and remember this most important fact. This is one of the key things that people in the space world, engineers, I love you people, but you got to understand, you love your machines much more than most people do. Uh, the machine, I love the machines, that's because I'm into it, but uh, the average person is more into Mohawk Guy and Adam Stelsner and, and you know, how they feel about it, frankly. And so uh, develop some people who are the face of your companies and start nurturing that. It can't just be you know, Elon and Jeff at the top. I'm not saying they shouldn't continue their, their dialogue with the public. But it needs to, let's flesh this out a little bit. Let's show some people. I want to see the 20-somethings who are making this a reality. And uh, I think if we do that, we're going to bring the public along for the ride. Now, you know, maybe many of you at your companies, you say, I, screw the public. I don't need the public. I think that's short-sighted. I think in the long run, uh, we are, after all, I think, thinking about uh, a greater goal, which has an element of altruism in it. We want to explore the final frontier. And if we can't get people enthused about that and really understanding what you all are doing, and that it's not just dueling billionaires with a hobby, we need people to understand the big picture and to start fleshing that story out. We need more characters, more dialogue. We need these, your companies to make friends with the public. So when you have a success, they understand the context and know exactly what you've accomplished. And God forbid, because it will happen one day, when you have a mishap, you will have friends. I'm here for your questions if you need them. I mean, I know it's late. There are cocktails to be had, and anybody? Mr. King. <laughs> uh, Miles Doug King from the Museum of Flight. So Jeff Bezos made a great speech a couple of weeks ago where he talked about um, the population growth on Earth in the last 75 years from 2 billion to 7 billion. Who's going to impose those limit, the limits on population growth? It won't be a government. It'll be nature. We need to move things that consume a lot of energy and um, cause pollution and so on off the planet and basically began to link this story to the future of humanity, not uh, to because we, just because we want to go. He, he even said, I think most people still think we're doing this to give a few rich people a great experience. We're doing it to save the earth. Do you think that'll resonate? I sure hope so. Um, I am doing now, it's in early phase, so I'm a little reluctant to talk about it, but I'm doing a multi-part series for PBS on this. And I really want people to understand that vision and get it past the uh, whatever snicker factor that might be when people start talking about that. Because the idea of humanity being a multi-planet species is not a crazy notion. And I, I firmly believe the way we're going on this planet, one way or another, we're going to have a narrow window to do this. And then we might miss that window, and then we're going to be in trouble. And yes, we need to explain that in the context of all the other things that are cool and interesting about space as well. Uh, but it, as soon as we can move it away from the... the um, dueling billionaire idea, I think the better for uh, public support and ultimately support for your companies and, you know, maybe customers one day. Yes. Yeah, you talked about space having accidents and there was one about a year and a half ago and, mm -hmm. you know, in the run up to that, Branson was talking about levels of safety that were ridiculous. Yeah. And, I, I, and I, he was making it sound both exciting and safe. And what are your thoughts on that? I mean, how does a commercial company both sell tickets and try to uh, be honest about what it's doing? I, I think um, probably a little more honesty is a good idea. I, you, you might lose some people on the list, but do you really want them to go if, if, you, if you give them the straight dope and they don't want to be there? I think that um, uh, I think you have to err on the side of... Um, you know, scaring people a little too much, especially if they're, you know, lining up to fly. Um, because, you know, and one of the big raps <clears throat> on, um, you know, Challenger, of course, was that, you know, Krista McAuliffe kind of parachuted in there a few months prior. And, you know, there's a lot of debate these days as to what she, if she fully understood the risks. NASA was talking itself into a, a safety posture that was, was not realistic. So I think we can all kind of get... Um, lulled into complacency in any realm we do. In this realm, it is extremely unforgiving. And I think we, are, we constantly have to remind ourselves. And, and I asked Sir Richard about that after the accident, if he, he felt he had been too sanguine. What did he say? He, he thought so, yeah. He, so, yeah. so they're... But he also, okay. felt, he also felt that he had told... He, he said that the people on his list, you know, were 
more um, engaged and were more um, aware of this than, than the general public. So maybe, maybe there are more communication to them, possibly. You said that. Yeah. Okay. Well. That counts for something, right? <laughs> Not necessarily. Not in your view. <laughs> yes. Once those paying passengers start flying to suborbital space, is that going to capture the public's imagination in your mind? I mean, is it going to exceed kind of the effect of the X Prize, which has been talked about in this conference, is a kind of a seminal moment for a lot of people yeah. in, in this industry? Oh, I, I think it's going to be incredible. I, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And it'll be for all the things we just talked about, and I, you know, and then some. I mean, think think how the X Prize captured uh, people's attention. Uh, you know, there were campers out there. It was it was like you know the, the heady days of Apollo with huge amounts of people, in of all places, Mojave, California, and uh, so yeah, I think this idea that it's kind of you know uh, there, there's a barrier that's been broken down, and 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 you know, let's face it, we're a pretty aspirational nation, right? You know. Uh, we, we all think we someday will have the, the quarter million bucks to go, right? So we, this is sort of like including everybody in the, in the routine, even though it may not be that totally realistic. So I do predict there will be a tremendous amount of interest in it. Um, whether CNN will break away from the Trump coverage for that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yes. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you very much for this. This has been super exciting for me personally, uh, as somebody that I think has a, a similar passion for getting more people excited. So. On that front, kind of two-part question, I guess. Um, the first is you, you sort of mentioned, which I think is, is very smart, like put a face on it, find the human angle within mm -hmm. space. But beyond that, wondering if you have other thoughts. I mean, I think we've all been in this conference, and, and space is such a broad term. There's so many different parts of space and things going on with satellites and exploration and colonization stuff. In, in your experience, have you found that there's certain storylines or parts of the, the space adventure that resonate more with people and then the second part is I think it's easy to talk about the general public as you know a mass of six yeah. billion people I'm, I'm curious if you found again in, in your experience are there certain demographics or, or how would you segment the the population across whether it's nationality gender age who's interested in all this yeah yeah exactly. it's, it's a really good question because I, I don't think you can use the NASA model as a template for this, because uh, I think they've done a, they have uh, 100 mile wide, half inch deep support. You know, people, NASA, it's, it's vaguely cool, right? This is good. And, and, and NASA equates to generally cool things, and, and that's good. But be, beyond that, they really don't, they're not engaged. As for the, um, so I think, I think there's an opportunity to, to take that to another level, because uh, you guys are not as constrained as NASA uh, with all the, the rules they have that limit their ability to market and, all, and the problem, the worries they have with the Hill and OMB and all these things. You have much more latitude, if you're willing. I mean, the, the concerns you guys would have would be, you know, proprietary information and ITAR worries and, uh, you know, mission safety, which are all relevant. But you really have a lot more latitude to tell your story if you want. And I can honestly tell you, I... When I walk at one of the 10 NASA centers or I go visit uh, the Mojave uh, Spaceport or wherever I end up, almost to a person, the people I talk to, I, every one of them is is fascinating, interesting person. They're not in it for the money. They're in it because they have a tremendous passion for it. So there's plenty of storytellers inside your companies. And, uh, you know, unleash them. Let, let them. let them be free and, and tell their stories. Um, can, can we be on the inside of things? Can we be there for some of the testing? You know, any, you know watching Felix Baumgartner jump like he did, that's, that's something you're going to watch, right? Can we be a part of that? You guys have to work out ways to make yourself comfortable with the public being there while you're, you know, kind of doing something that's very risky. Um, I think, again, counterintuitively, the reward is greater than the downside on that. But again, that's pretty self-serving. But that's, you know, that's what I do. I'm in TV. So anyway, thank, thank you very much. I think that was all the time we have. I'm around if you have any more questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Andy.